Stuff that'll make you faster and stronger and make the bad guys cry like an anime fan on prom night. Funny, I actually went to prom. Yeah, with the friend I was in the anime club with. This is her. I do not think your advertising means what you think it means. This is going to seem like an odd tangent, but I missed a hack. This year would have been the first time since 2012 that I haven't done a single dot hack review in the entirety of my show, as last December I reviewed the last of its content that I could review. I still get gratitude on social media for talking about dot hack like I did, even with the lackluster quality of my earlier videos, and I'm very appreciative of that. It still astounds me that such a good series could so collapse in on itself, to the point that it effectively died off outside of the mobile games using its properties. And I received word of its most recent mobile game, New World, deciding to shut down just as I was editing this video, meaning for the time being .hack really is dead, while other newer series show that there was still a market for its empathetic, story-driven, and thought-provoking content on more mainline consoles or television. Despite the forerunner for such digital realm scenarios still around being utter garbage defined by the writer Idiot Ball for self-insert wish fulfillment. Yeah, I don't like Sword Art Online, nor its creator and fandom existing .hack was a ripoff of it when Sal hadn't even been put up as a web novel when .hack sign had already begun airing on television and the core games were simply awaiting their already scheduled release dates. And even if you try to make that argument with the GU sect of the series, that doesn't work due to how much of GU is built off of stuff from its first era. It's pretty damn contiguous. Besides, Tron predates both series for the trapped in a computer realm or game scenario, so it's hard to stick a claim as a series being ripped off when your concept is not in and of itself original and outside of that common element, your story is otherwise bland and derivative of other fantasy works and could easily have been told with little difference as a bunch of kids teleported into a fantasy world and challenged to become great legendary warriors. Still, I've seen a lot of series lately that have tried to stylize themselves like Sal or use virtual world or gaming interactions to create or facilitate their stories. Log Horizon, Overlord, and he thought there was never a girl online, ReZero, No Game No Life. It's a growing list, some of them are actually good. But this all shows that there's still a market for dot .hack's empathetic, character and crisis driven stories. And this line of thought got me to thinking, there are other series from the 2000s aside from dot .hack that utilize their general story engines of a world approaching a technological event horizon and getting a new different tier of interaction with the virtual plane, and are actually good! And this happens to be one of them, and even predated Dot .hack by about a year or two. I got into the Mega Man Battle Network series after my original falling out with Dot .hack after the Legend of the Twilight anime. First through the mixed quality dub of the anime, it gets better during access, I will freely admit the first season is pretty badly done, then afterwards the actual games. The first one I played being Battle Network 3, Blue. I don't feel I need to inform anyone about the Mega Man series by Capcom. They're pretty much ingrained into gaming culture from the Nintendo Entertainment System through Generation 7, with 10 first series games, plus spin-offs, 9 X-Era games, 2 Legends, 4 Zero GBA games, and the ZX Duology which serve as the main continuity for the series. And all of them... Well, almost all of them are good. 8, X7 and X8, I think one or two of the Zero ones and the ZX's people take issue with, but by and far, Mega Man is one of the most beloved and widely well-regarded franchises in video game history. It's just a bit sad that Capcom was so awful to it, its creator jumped ship, and his spiritual successor got stuck in development hell before showing up as... Porta Mediocre. But hey! It's better than nothing! The thing is, however, I suck at the main Mega Man series. 
Seriously, I'm not just talking the NES classically Nintendo hard ones, I mean all of them. I'm so terrible at them that I can rarely get past any of the stages. Jump and shoot is not a skill I ever acquired. Once again, due to the severe motor control issues I physically possess, which prevent me from ever gaining the fine control and reaction time required to be good at Mega Man's Nation platformers. I tried for years to little to no avail. So yeah, the Battle Network series ended up being more up my alley, as the series is primarily an RPG, revolving around Lan Hikari, aka Neto Hikari, and his brother Hub, aka Saito, the latter of which has been turned into the net navi AI Mega Man. Yeah, there's a lot of weird in that, so let me give you the gist. The Battle Network series occurs in an alternate timeline to the main Mega Man series, where instead of constructing robots, Drs. Tadashi Hikari and Albert Wiley focus development on expanding computer efficiency and processing power, connecting the world into a massive network cyberspace, and designing an interface which allows people to interact with the network as if it were a metaphysical plane of existence with the assistance of specialized AI programs called Net Navigators, Net Navis for short. Their partnership and camaraderie lasted far longer than in the main timeline, and both eventually had their own families and faded from the spotlight, Dr. Hikari's son in turn having twins, which are our deuteragonists. The elder brother Hub suffered from a severe heart illness and died not long after birth, but their father, Yuichiro Hikari, managed to save him by, to keep things simple, digitalizing his soul and created for him his own digital body to become Mega Man. This relationship is revealed to Lan over the course of the first game, and despite his virtual existence, he's recognized as being human and part of their family, just as he would be had he not died, even though he lives his entire life in the electronics device Lan keeps with him at all times, called a PET, which is short for Personal Terminal. But because of that dual existence, Mega Man is far more than any mere program, and despite the seemingly basic nature of his design necessitated by how complex his data is, he has the potential to grow and evolve beyond anything in the net just as the original Rock, Roll, Blues, X, and Zero were far more than simple machines themselves. And this is a game intended for children that has as its backstory death, existential questions, several moral quandaries of leaving someone in such a state, and the expected life-threatening situations as crime has likewise moved with the time to take advantage of the state of cyberspace and be able to affect things on a larger scale due to said interconnectivity. I love it when a writer doesn't talk down to their audience. Unfortunately, this specific story point was pretty gutted in localization, so when it's explained in the story text, yeah, it doesn't make the most sense. And with such a systematic hardline from the network, viral firewalls in the future are not that effective. But due to its metaphysical rendering, any NetNavi or combat program is able to fight off such attacks and write system data, this being referred to as virus busting, which serves to give the game most of its enemies. Battle Network is an amalgamated turn-based and area-locked RPG, with you able to control the relevant net navi in the region to fight the viruses on the opposing side, using Mega Man's standard buster. Fun fact, Mega Man.exe is the only Mega Man in the franchise to be right-handed. Every other one favors their left hand, even if they are ultimately ambidextrous. Or the game's collectible battle chips, which are obtained through a combination of merchants, or given as rewards for doing well against viruses and enemy navies and need to evade their attacks so you won't lose your limited life points. The game starts you out at 100, and you can improve them up to 1000 each game. Likewise, the buster only does 1 point of damage, but can be charged to an attack that does 10, and later upgraded so it maxes out at an 80 point charge shot, though later entries max it out at 50. But as you can tell with how weak the buster is, you won't progress far at all with the initial chips they give you, arranged in a folder that can hold 30, but by proxy it takes a lot of time and effort to get the right chips for the best folders, due to how the gameplay separates them through a lettered typing system. You can either use multiples of the same chip to whatever number you want in a turn, as long as you have the number of them sustainable in the chip folder, or you can only use chips that align to a specific letter, with the exception of asterisk chips from the later games, which are generally weaker support chips meant to be used as part of chains. But to that exceedingly elaborate collection for these damn things, I admit I normally have three words. Game Shark, fuck that. But as a personal rule, I don't use cheat devices when I'm collecting footage for review, even with how ludicrous the time sync is for them. And I mean it more than triples the game length, making it on par with some of the more agonizingly tedious Square Enix games, and how much the grinding stretches things out pointlessly when I'm usually here for the story, my enjoyment of the battle system, and the fun of building whatever chip holders I want, as there is a lot of variety. 
The problem with this collection being most chips drop solely when you achieve a higher virus busting rate, which you can't get until you build a better folder, which you can't do until you get the better chips. Then even get into how currency gain also collects at a snail's pace, meaning early game progression is ridiculously slow, and you'll feel like you're doing nothing for hours as you need to get these things to even be able to face a proper boss, let alone survive against the viruses, when most fights should take you no more than 30 seconds, and you need to do them in under 10 to actually get close to a proper reward. Do not even get into how some of the battleships were special event release exclusives, or were otherwise removed from the imported versions of the games, or part of things locked out to special content normal players could not access without a rare periphery or other game. Thus, while their data still exists, you can't actually acquire them without cheating. Or the fact that later games, Battle Networks 4 and 5 especially, have higher tier versions of the chips necessary for completion accessible only in the post-game or other version which once more shoots your original game progression straight in the foot, as you can't enjoy the game by building the best battle chip deck until after you're already done with it. And I hate it when games lack the best gear until after you're done with it and it's worthless, especially when they lack a New Game Plus mode, as if there was a New Game Plus. It'd be a reward for completing it the first time, so you'd have more fun replaying the experience. Still, while this collection aspect is improved in later entries, even the mid-game enemies can kick your ass if you operate Mega Man badly, or just try and fill a folder with anything you want. So it's not like the chips are an automatic win button anyways. I brought this all up and admitted to my game cheating sin, because the first game is one where you get punished for using codes due to it being very, very bugged. Several of them game-breaking. And I'm not certain if they ever fixed the non-code-based bugs when they recently ported the entries into the Wii U and 3DS. For there are periodically event NPCs that lock out your progression in the game if you've not advanced your collection upgraded enough. The specific one that breaks the game if you cheated the chips being when you need something from the Sister of Land's teacher Mari, named Yuri, in order to progress the World 3 storyline in the game. If you use the battle chip code, the game won't read you as having any battle chips. So no matter how many you acquire, you will never get past this checkpoint. What is even the hell, Yuriko? I mean, yeah, you're evil, you were raised by Dr. Wily, but you're not supposed to become active until Regal starts distributing dark chips. Granted, in the first game, the battle chips kinda suck. While they're not exactly underpowered like they'd be in certain later entries, it's not exactly easy to build efficient chip folders. Not help that most of the program advances are pretty useless or not worth the resources put into them. Program advances are special chip combinations that, when used in sequence, create an attack intended to be far more powerful and combat beneficial than if you use them individually. It was one of the highlights and hallmarks of the Battle Network battle system that really made them fun. Especially one specific combination. The Beta Sword, also known more commonly as the Dream Sword or Life Sword, is my third favorite program advance. It appears in every game and is present in most of my battleship folders, but isn't exactly good in the first game and was more than likely changed to reflect the anime version after this. This is because most of the program advances in the first entry just do the same thing, permitting multitudes of uses of the combined battleships for either unlimited charges over a set time or doubles the number of times you can use it. Now both are useful, I don't deny that, it's just they take a lot more setup time to not be a waste of the chips, and with the ones with the set number of uses, the chip they copy the attack of is randomized. So an example of the Beta Sword program advance, you might end up attacking with the Normal Sword six times, or with Wide Sword, or the Long Sword, or a mix of the three in any sequence, but all that does is limit you to the attack range of the Normal Sword chip if you want to ensure you deal damage with each hit. Now, as I usually use sword chips more than any other in my playstyle, that isn't as big an issue, since I tend to stock a ridiculous amount of the area steel chips. But considering that there isn't that big a bonus to combining them, oftentimes there's no incentive to trying to create the combos. Later games fix this by improving the program advances drastically, and making them easier to align with the given chip folder's dynamic. But you're likely to cast the majority of them only once. And that one time is to register them in the program advance memo, which is part of each game's completion checklist. 
The most useful program advances here I find to be Zeta Cannon, as it's good for virus busting the common baddies and does make you invulnerable for a short time, if it is a program advance that requires chips of three different letters to use, which are usually the least useful advances. Gut Shoot, as using it twice in succession can literally kill any of the bosses. Lifesaver, as it heals your Mega Man and reinforces him with an aura. And my second favorite program advance, Double Hero. I love it. I love it so. Though I'm always irritated it doesn't show up in Battle Networks 4 and 5, alongside those entries entirely lacking any type of Navi-based program advances. Oh, and if you're wondering, my favorite program advance of all time is Master Style and Master Cross from Battle Networks 3 and 6. I just really like the idea of an all-form simultaneous attack barrage for some reason. Now this is all helped by the Battle Networks having some of the best gameplay introduction tutorials in gaming with how straightforward they are in explaining everything up front. The gameplay interface is a bit different in each entry, so while you know the info the tutorial tells you, as you progress along the games the differences and balance changes do add up. So even on replay they can seem like a refresher course on what works where. Anyways, our story opens in the Japanese Tokyo XP, Den City, later called Den Tech City or Elect Town, with focus kept on the suburbs of ACDC. Get it? Electricity puns! This is where we first find Lan and Mega Man, the pair being fifth graders in this setting, and having to deal with normal kid stuff in the future, such as school and homework. Their love interest, male Sakurai, sending insanely obvious signals she's into them, despite being at most 12, and that being mirrored in her Navi role for Hub. I hold a bit of a preference for her characterization in the anime, where she's a bit more Sundere. <laughs> Fights with the rival for her affection's Dex, challenging you constantly to prove he's better with his Navi Gutsman. With them all being told off by the fourth friend who somehow manages to be a fifth wheel, Yai, and her Net Navi Glide. Yai and Glide, the latter being a reference to Mega Man Legends, are probably the most useless characters in the series. As aside from adding another girl to the story, they don't really do anything. Ever. Hell, Glide, in all ten games featuring the Battle Network cast, only seven of which I'll be discussing, as two were never important, and I am not suffering through Battle Chip Challenge again, never has anything more than an overworld sprite. You never fight him or get any form of Navi chip or special ability relating to him. Hell, he's pretty much useless as a Navi, and could have been replaced in his duties by one of the random Mr. Programs you see hanging around the internet. Once again, this is somewhat remedied in the anime as they actually have the pair do something, but usually with it relating to comedic purposes, as there the joke is Yai is ridiculously rich. And of course, to top it all off, a repairman installs a virus into your mom's kitchen, so the oven begins spewing flames everywhere. No! My biscuits are burning! And this is why I want my parents to switch to an electric oven, as I know this is going to happen eventually. This was set by Mr. Match and his Navi Fireman, the man being one of the most recurring secondary characters, with only being absent in one entry in the series. As right now, he's working for the nefarious terrorist organization, World 3! And yeah, despite it being abbreviated with WWW as yet another technology pun, if I list every one of them, we're going to be here all day. The name of the terrorist group is World 3. I checked the Japanese pronunciation on this. It wasn't something changed for the import. I would have honestly had it spelled out, but... What do I know? There might have been a character limit or something. Now, as I inferred earlier, the first botch of each entry is ridiculously difficult due to how bad the starting chips are, and not made any better as the battleship types that you can get from the enemies when you encounter a boss tend to have the same elemental alignment. In the first three games, it matching the cliché of fire beats wood, beats electricity, beats water, beats fire. And when facing Fire Man, you have no ability to gain any water chips, which would deal double damage. And worse, it's quite some time until you encounter someone that's actually weak to fire chips, as unlike the Classic and X series, you don't get to choose your storyline opponent since, while you're not locked to story progression rails and can go back and do nearly any side content you want to, you can only face the game's bosses in a specific given order. 
Fortunately, the game recognizes this and does not start you out with facing the enemy navvies at full power. But have you revisit battles with them later on with random data that more reflects their true battle capability, though you need to often track them down at random on specific net maps. The only thing I can suggest early on is get good at dodging. Collect shield chips from the mentors that will reflect damage, and possibly farm the cannon viruses to get the Zeta Cannon program advance. The Navi boss regions, in similarity to their main platformer counterparts, all tend to have their own puzzles, either mazes you need to traverse or obstacles to clear with the means provided. The oven computer, in example, needs you to put out fires, but you have a limited number of ice cubes that will put out each blaze. The trick being you need to use them to get through to Fireman as opposed to put them all out to progress onwards. A distinction I only make as they end up making you do that in one of the later games. Still, even though we defeat Fireman, a Hallmark tile World 3 starts out as good villains is, well, even when they lose, they still manage to achieve an interim goal, Mr. Match retrieving a program needed for that actual big plan. And what was this program doing in an oven in a random house? Well, okay, I guess since this is the Hikari family, who all have significant ties to the network's developments, either Tadashi or Yuichiro could have hidden it there, but it just seems contrived. Later, on a day Lan ends up being late to school, their teacher Miss Mar introduces Higsby, a rare chip trader who's been hired on as a teaching assistant. And his first lesson is on the wonders of mass brainwashing! Projecting an indoctrination message straight from the big bad guy of the game you expected to see. The one... The only, Dr. Albert Wiley, as he also exposits on World 3's ultimate goal, the end game, the final solution, to take control of all of cyberspace, including any military or dangerous technology it's interfaced with, and use that to destroy the entire world. The only cure for this rotten world is deletion! Yeah, that is an exaggeration. Wiley's motivations more than anything in this iteration, in contrast against his mainline counterparts, does not involve world domination. He seriously thinks there's something wrong with the modern world, and wants to tear it down in any way he can. More prominently, this is informed as we learn later he was a robotics engineer like his mainline self, but whose work was shunned in favor of development of the world network. And though he too contributed to this through the evidence seen later in Battle Network 5, his efforts were once more overshadowed by that of Dr. Light. Dr. Hikari, same difference. But while in Mainline Wily this was expressed as a desire to conquer, here it's a bit more abstract in his desire for wholesale chaos and destruction, but not fully in a manner that's spiteful. As there's this subtext, when you consider all of his appearances in these games and in the anime, that there's something more to why he's only decided to go about this now, after Tadashi Hikari has died. As if the true, legitimate friendship that you had in this iteration was one of the few lines to sanity he had. And in the wake of it all, that respect has turned to hate and rage at being forgotten while his colleague was solely exalted as the bringer of the modern world. Unfortunately, whatever that was specifically was lost in script localization. All of the Battle Network games hit with improper translation to varying degrees, with Battle Network 4 being the worst of them. And think, before 4Kids Entertainment made it big, this kind of crap was steeply on the decline. Wily is portrayed as little more than a terrorist in this iteration of such. The best I can figure from the context of the Soulnet scenes from Battle Network 5 and the anime version of this Wily is he had a psychotic break after he believed he lost his son. Though considering what we see of that son later on, it might also have something to do with the whole dark chip corruption mess. I'm just speculating at this point considering he eventually snaps back to some range of sanity by the series end and was considered to once be a good man in the past. The anime version doing away with him as a villain far earlier, and his later appearances turning him into a somewhat neutral ally, seen most prominently in Mega Man's stream. Still, mainline Wily, it's funny, but Wily's one of those villains that never tries to cause intentional harm to humans with his world conquest schemes. That's probably the most different thing about this incarnation, where that is his entire end goal. Each of the weapons he seeks to create will result in catastrophic levels of destruction, People are constantly put in danger by his organization's plans, and are harmed often, some even left near death. Like in Battle Network 3, where they attack a hospital at the same time someone with a life-threatening heart condition is undergoing surgery. You know, for kids! Now, why do I think he had a psychotic break in the first place? 
Well, frankly, it's again tying back into Mainline, because we see robots still exist in the Battle Network universe from the later entries. They're just not as prolific as in the Mainline canon. And with the context of Wily being the roboticist, it kind of informs the Mainline universe as well. Wily builds so many robots there, but they're not the most intelligent, whereas Light's Rock, Roll, Blues, and X are all fully developed AI. So this builds the context Light was a better programmer, while Wily a more talented engineer. But with robots more scarce, his genius in their construction I would think would lead to him being more heralded, since his greatest intellectual rival expressed himself in a differing pursuit. He still would not have been the foremost authority in this world as robots would be more ubiquitous, but he wouldn't have been forgotten outright since that work wouldn't have been miscredited to his more sociable colleague. Again, much of that is speculation, but it's still interesting to see the contrast between the two versions like this. Though sadly, through evidence of the power plant stage of the game and World 3's goal of destroying the world, the Battle Network seem to have made the same damn error that I called out and thus require the same damn critique I made way back in Dothack G Redemption. All of the nuclear power facilities throughout the world. At present, operations at all of them have become abnormal. Yep, that's the one. No one is stupid enough to connect a power plant to a broadband network specifically for this reason. With a hydroelectric dam, it could cause untold flooding. With a nuclear power plant, you could cause a meltdown. Screw worldwide weapons of war being put on remote control. Anything that has to do with anything nuclear better stay on an isolated system out of safety. It's not explicitly stated they'd be able to do that, but if you can access and screw with a power plant, it's pretty thoroughly implied. Hell, they don't even need to go that far to create conditions that would kill people, as later events in this game and other entries showcase but that is how far they can go every time the games reach their climaxes. Anyways, this stage of the game has you dive into the school computer network to unlock the gates around the school to get to the main server to shut down this broadcast. Also to increase land's grade point average by two letter grades. Most of the net regions here are locked out by simple math and trivia questions, as you would expect from a school, requiring it shift focus to land to get the answers and more prominently show how the two operate together to overcome these challenges. The pair eventually coming across... Miss Mari trapped in a closet? Well, this is awkward. Especially since Higsby spends the entire anime trying to court Mari. I should also note that the school network is the first place to encounter these ghosts who give up invisible chips. Invisible chips render you immune to damage for set periods of time, the higher ones just increasing the duration, and prove invaluable throughout all of the games if you're not the best at dodging. Some folders by design do not have room for them, and these viruses can be a bit of a hassle to deal with if you don't have a wide-hitting attack that can tag them. Like, say, Wide Sword. But this is another enemy you need to farm that can be a bitch to deal with early on. So worth it, though, as the next farming location for a higher tier version is not for a while. Higsby's Navi, Number Man, is admittedly one of the easier bosses, as everything he has which deals damage is based on numbers and timing all of his attacks having a time delay until they hit, or explode during which they can be destroyed. Higsby himself is kind of a dick, having signed on to World 3 because they paid him in rare chips. And this is why having an obsession with collecting things is... bad? There's a question mark at the end of that statement, since the entire way to progress your abilities in these games is by collecting crap. And the way a toy line for this series eventually became trying to sell battleships as if they were a TCG. Well, we kick his ass and... Somehow, that proves his obsession wrong. It really does not in any way. Your race up is ridiculously broken. But at the very least, he turns himself over to the officials, this series' version of the police, where they have him give all the information he can about World 3, before being released and opening the franchise's premier battleship and power-up shop. Though there are also online net dealers in all of these games that sell stuff, but none of them have the number trader that gives you free stuff by entering codes. Wait, right, they didn't add that until Battle Network 3, what am I thinking? Well, whatever. They still have chip traders where you can put in extra copies of chips you farmed to get ones randomly generated from the entire chip library. Another suggestion to getting around the collection mess is to save before inserting each set, and then resetting if you didn't get anything helpful. You only need, at max, five copies of each chip in each letter code anyways, most of which you won't even end up using. So if you're looking for something hard to find early on, that may be your best bet. Even though, again, you'll likely be spending a few hours farming crap, and it's likely you'll get a duplicate. Next up is Lan visiting his dad at Scilab, as he messages them about having a power-up program for Mega Man, 
which he is prevented from heading to grab by the local metro line shutting down, which requires a trip to the general network to find what shut down the entire system. This results in another battle with the World 3 Navi, Stone Man, which is... Another surprisingly easy fight, mainly as he doesn't move, and all of his attacks, while powerful, are once more easy to dodge. This brings us to the government complex, where in the courtyard we find one of the more useful optional bosses, Woodman. I don't know why, but I really like wood element ships. They're probably what I end up using the second most frequently after sword types, mainly because I find most electrotype viruses and navvies insufferable due to that damn paralysis effect so many of them have. And in this game, the battleship Wood Tower, while slow to deploy, is another that's pretty freaking useful, and is found from viruses in the network right in front of Sal. If you've farmed enough fire chips to fill a folder from the oven computer, it's another easy farming location, alongside it making it easier to break Woodman, since he's the first nav that you'll fight where you will have chips that allow you to deal double damage. There's more chip farming opportunities in Dr. Hikari's lab, for while their dad is out, Yuichiro has a virus generator in his PC for free battles against things you're equal in power level, but you might just keep missing when you're trying to find them in the overworld. Hey, I said the battleship collection is tedious. I didn't say they didn't try to insert ways to remedy that, and if it wasn't for some of these time sinks, oh my would the time sink be worse than any given Square Enix game. 